Chaque zone de l'UM6P est équipée d'un plan d'évacuation qui indique les sorties de secours et les gestes à tenir en cas d'urgence. Prenez votre temps de l'observer ou demandez de l'accompagnement par le staff organisateur de l'événement. En cas d'écoute d'alarme, prendre du temps, ne pas se précipiter, suivre les équipiers d'évacuation ou le chemin le plus proche vers une sortie de secours indiquée par cette signalétique. Ne pas utiliser l'ascenseur. Une fois dehors, se déplacer vers le point de rassemblement pour confirmer votre sécurité aux responsables d'évacuation et ne pas quitter le point de rassemblement qu'après autorisation. Si vous êtes le premier à notifier une situation d'urgence au sein des lieux de l'événement, vous devez activer le système d'alarme en poussant sur les déclencheurs manuels. Nos équipes sont à votre disposition et vous souhaitent un excellent événement. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. My, my name is Fouad Laroui. I am a professor of philosophy of science at this uh, university. And um, I'm the organizer of Science We with Saatazi and uh, Reda Ben Kiran and many other people. Um, this uh, Science Wing has not yet begun because nothing begins before the president of the university says so. So I'm giving the floor to Hisham Lavti, president of the UM6P. Assalamu alaikum, bonjour, good morning, excellencies, professors, ladies, gentlemen, esteemed guests. Traditions are hard to establish especially in modern times. Today, on behalf of our community at Mohammed VI Polytechnic University, I am honored to welcome you to the third edition of Science Week. I'm particularly proud that this annual gathering here in Morocco has now become a traditional venue of scholars, experts, thinkers, artists, and all lovers of science from around the world. This may seem evident for us as academics, but it, it is worth repeating whenever we can. There is so much to celebrate about science, not only because it is appealing and though provoking by design, but also because it has always been there to tackle the complex issues of humanity with precision and impact. This is what every UM6P Science Week has been about since 2021, exploring the linkages between scientific research and contemporary issues. In this respect, this year's theme for UM6P Science Week is on point. If we have chosen complexity as a subject this year, it is indeed because the state of the world today is marked by the convergence of many interconnected parameters. As such, even our understanding of science is called to evolve. Take a moment to contemplate some of the events that mark humanity lately. A couple of years ago, a viral outbreak in Asia spread across the planet, paralyzing entire countries, economies, and livelihoods. Last year, a geopolitical crisis in Europe disrupted trade with other continents, still sending commodity prices to the roof and impacting global food security. Just recently, 
An AI-powered tool called ChatGPT is demonstrating that it can imitate human thinking, writing, and planning with scary precision. Some are already asking if their job will even exist in a decade. Quick, sharp, and chaotic is in their disruptions. These examples require sophistications in their understanding. We cannot afford to look at them one discipline at a time because there is nothing linear about them. For the longest time, science was indeed linear in its perception of all phenomena. Newton, Descartes, and their disciples were convinced that by breaking down phenomena, we could grasp their complexity. Divide and conquer may have been adequate for the first industrial revolution, but it cannot keep up with the fourth industrial revolution an evolved reality requires an evolved science. Indeed, our modern science, complexity is the name of the game. Would we have the benefit from the life-saving COVID vaccine if mathematicians, medical doctors, computer scientists, and nanotechnology specialists did not push through in tandem, constantly merging their expertise? In a time when climate change has an impact on food, on food security, can we really say that agriculture in the business of agronomists alone? Surely data scientists, economists, water specialists, policy planners, and environmental experts have their say on the matter as well. In a job market where skills does not mean speciality anymore, complexity is in the pursuit on and production of knowledge is even more relevant today. A good engineering is one who understands the social utility of what they build. A successful business executive is one who displays technological literacy. And an impactful policymaker must be able to grasp the technicalities of their decisions. At Mohammed VI Polytechnic University, the term polytechnic is a case in point for us. Our development-focused mission has led us to merge speciality and perspectives very early on. On one hand, we are aware that tackling the challenges of Morocco and Africa does not happen in a vacuum, but is part of a momentum of an emerging global south. On the other hand, our science, business, and humanities departments do not exist in silos. On the contrary, the students and the researchers are challenged to work hand in hand for a more realistic impact. For this edition of UM6P Science Week, I'm delighted to see that all of our university's departments are participating at once. Each department has adapted the overreaching theme, complexity, to its own research agenda. I'm confident that this it is the beginning of something beautiful in our academic community. To all our guests, students, researchers, or staff, I have one request for this UM6P Science Week. Dare to explore, listen, discover, and ask challenging questions. Among us this week are some of the most prestigious scholars worldwide. We should all feel privileged to have them as guests in our community. Happy UM6P Science Week to you all. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear students, glad to see you. A lot of you have come today. My friends and partners in crime, Saad Tezi and Reda bin Kiran, will say later a couple of things about this edition of Science Week, adding to what President Labdi has just said. Uh, me, I shall take this opportunity to answer a question that has been asked of me since we announced a couple of months ago uh, complexity as the common theme of this edition. The question is, how do you choose the annual theme of Science Week at UM6P? Well, one thing is obvious. The challenge is to choose a theme that is common to all scientific domains. 
In fact, it boils down to a discussion between two schools of thought. The first one, <clears throat> there are those who believe in the unity of science, a position exemplified by the Arabic, the Arab Andalusian thinker Ibn Tufail. It rests on the assumption of unity of being, wahdat al wujud in Arabic, an idea whose chief proponent was the great Sufi thinker Ibn Arabi, or to give him his uh, full name, and I have to take a deep breath here, a Sheikh Al Akbar Muhyiddin Abu Abdullah Muhammad Ibn Arabi Al Tayl Khatim Al Qushari Sultan Al Arifin. That's the real name of Ibn Arabi. Wahdad Al Wujud. For this school of thought, unity of being implies unity of knowledge, unity of science. And therefore, there are common themes to all disciplines. Origins, stability and change, movement, causality, final cause, finalism or not, quantity, proportion, patterns, symmetry. That's the first school of thought. There are those, that's the second school of thought, there are those who believe that different scientific domains have different concerns, different methods, some of them intrinsic to one domain and uh, unknown to others. For example, in the manuals of uh, Mécanique Rationnelle that I had to study for my sins, in the same engineering school as our sainted president, <laughs> you would search in vain for the concept of emergence. Mécanique rationnelle, they don't know what emergence is, simply not there. But emergence, l'émergence, is one of the most interesting concepts of today's scientific research. When Stuart Kaufman says that the laws of physics do not entail evolution, it seems to me that it's more or less the same idea. But wait, Stuart Kaufman is here among us. Actually, I'm pointing at him in a very impolite way. So uh, we'll get with him to the bottom of things from the horse's mouth, if you'll pardon my French mixing of metaphors. For the, for the school of thought, the not so common themes between scientific disciplines are non-linearity, chaos, complexity, bifurcation, fractals, and so on. And then there are also some themes that reeks of metaphysics, which I personally do not like, but academic freedom is a great common good. And if colleagues want to ponder how many angels can dance on the tip of an iceberg. See, another mixing of metaphors. Let's have fun. So you see, choosing a common theme for Science Week is in itself an epistemologic endeavor, sometimes even an ideologic battle. Until now, that uh, ideologic battle has been done during a relaxed lunch in Marrakesh under an olive tree, I kid you not, really under an olive tree, by two or three persons, the initiators of Science Week. This year, we have decided to innovate. At the end of Science Week on Friday, those of you who will still be here, we call them the survivors will convene under the pergola here and decide in a very democratic way what the theme of next year's Science Week will be. In other words, we are replacing the limited intelligence of me and my buddies, the three amigos, <laughs> by the collective intelligence of the brilliant minds we have assembled here this year. There is only one place in the whole world where you can get a master's degree in collective intelligence, and it's here at UM6P. Under the guidance of my friend Lex Paulson and his many amigos, well, it's not a coincidence. Okay, 
Uh, I've been reminded to tell you that uh, we have simultaneous translation and you can get all the apparatus there. And uh, I would like to finish by uh, thanking our president of OCP, Mustafa Tarab, for being here today. Has many, many obligations, but every week of science, uh, he does us the honor of being here. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here. And I give the floor to my colleagues, Reda Bin Kiran and Saad Tezi, who have done a tremendous job in helping organize this edition of Science Week. Thank you. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, let me begin by expressing my particular happiness for being here today as UMX, UM6P is offering us all the opportunity to explore and deepen a fascinating topic. First of all, I would like to thank all of the UM6P staff for its mobilization and hard work on this international meeting. I thank more particularly the organizers uh, uh, and uh, uh, my friends and colleagues, Fouad Larry and Saad Tezi, for the quality of their work, making the Science Week a catalytic moment in the life of the university. It has been a pleasure for me to collaborate with them almost immediately after I joined the Africa Business School, for which complexity is a crucial issue. Classical science postulates that what is scientific must be general and generic regular and linear. The sciences of complexity go further and study what is singular, irregular, and predictable. All what constitutes the very nature and texture of most real phenomena around us. As a social anthropologist, I have been working on complexity for the past 25 years, starting with a two-year survey on the field, during, during which I interviewed over 50 outstanding scientists. I then spent the next 20 years researching complexity and emergence, culminating in men and in society. I would like to draw your attention today to the importance of apprehending the complexity, emergence, self-organization manifested in what is called the humanities. Let us consider, for instance, the notion of randomness and destiny. Who would have imagined 25 years ago that after meeting Edgar Morin and Luke Steele's uh, or conversing with Gregory Scheiting, Stuart Kaufman, and Eva Eklund, I would meet them here and now, all together with other major scientists and thinkers of complexity. And, would, and who could have thought that such a gathering would take the form of a summit on, on complexity held in my own native country? Who could have predicted a couple of decades ago that Ben Geary would become the sci-tech and sinking plane, la plane qui pense, of Morocco and indeed the whole continent. In this contingent history, blending individual trajectories and global issues, what is the part of chance? What is the part of destiny? During this week, there will certainly be discussions on the role of randomness in mathematics, physics, and biology. It is instructive to see how random, fertile situations sometimes become, becomes possib become possibilities of realities that occasionally converge towards a destiny and a destination. Scientists need to take destiny and destination very seriously. This is the case of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, the United Nations body assessing the science related to climate change and its impact on the biosphere. I would like to share a definition of destiny that today can be mathematized, a definition proposed almost a century ago by the Indian philosopher Mohammed Iqbal, probably the most knowledgeable, most knowledgeable non-Western philosopher of, of his time when it comes to science. Iqbal claims that destiny is time regarded as prior to the disclosure of its possibilities. 
We are living the golden age of complexity. Science, culture, society, economy, politics, every field of our multifaceted reality is now driven by an unprecedented pace of change. Compress complexity is increasingly at work at the different levels of our physical world, but also in our individual psyche and collective consciousness. At the same time, we are living a dark age of complexity with an increasing risk of seeing the digital transformation and artificial intelligence contribute to generate a knowledge peak with the probability that the next generation of citizens might know much less than what we know, completely contro controlled and manipulated like cognitive cattle, beta cognitive. In addition, our way of life, how we are exploiting nature and its resources are making the planet the worst of possible worlds. We therefore have to confront this highly uncertain state of existence with both new and promising possibilities and the almost inevitable approach of a final hour due to our selfish, supremacist, violent and consumerist urges. Complexity is in fact a universal declaration of interdependence for better and for worse. We must understand that what affects the environment, the living beings, on the other side of the planet may have tragic consequences for us as well. It is the famous butterfly effect, only over amplified and generalized. We are all in the same boat, so if there is still time, let us divert it from a titanic route and fate. Complexity contributes to making science a more realistic and modest quest. It highlights the limits of science. We are now facing geophysical limits due to an anthropic situation, saturation of space and time. In this time of cascading crisis and civilizational hiatus, September 11, 2001, financial collapse in 2008, Fukushima nuclear disaster in 2011, social uprisings and movements all over the world during the 2010s, the COVID-19 pandemic, Complexity is somehow taking revenge on us. We are not here together for a whole week by a mere chance. We have converged here because we have work to do together. We have to consider a problem of lack of resources, space and time after having commoditized almost everything on Earth. We're confronted with the hard problem of what I call a just a restrictive geometry. How, when we are short and on time and space, can we pave the plane by doing better with less, by doing much better with much less? This is indeed the most complex issue at stake. Mohammed Iqbal approached the notion of complexity in a very subtle manner, linking it to the spiritual connection to nature and its continuous creation and evolution, connection that we have all lost due to our collective and quasi-religious belief in market fundamentalism and infinite consumerism. Iqbal's claims that an act is temporal or profane if it is done in a spirit of detachment from the infinite complexity of life behind it. It is spiritual if it is in inspired by that complexity. We're not here by chance. We need to anticipate the destiny of humanity before the disclosure of its possibilities, before its most probable fatal bifurcations as well as its promising ones. Complexity is two-sided and expresses the emergence and its possibilist properties, chemical, physical, biological, and cultural properties that transform some potentialities into realities. Here again, I cannot find better illustration of what emergent is than the words of the Andalusian poet Antonio Machado, who says that, Walker, there is no pass. The pass is made by walking. Walking, you make the pass. Let us then walk together and make the pass during this unique uh, science week. And more importantly, let us walk our talks along the age of chaos. In this perspective, I wish us all creative and fruitful conversation. Finally, uh, I have a request addressed to all of you, participants, managers, professors, students of UM6P, uh, uh, the public. 
I will be at your service during this international confer conference and will be accompanied during the whole week by a group of six talented people from the Africa Business School. These participant observers will be in charge of a digital humanities workshop and would like to capture outside the plenary sessions a maximum of spaces and moments, vivid situations, spontaneous discussions, comments, critical viewpoints for the purpose of developing later various multimedia didactic support. I'm asking you to kindly welcome them on your side and facilitate this continued continuous workshop by giving them a little bit of your attention all along the week. Please talk, work with them, talk to them. Thank you very much. Bonjour. Donc en fait, euh, je vais faire une présentation très très rapide. C'est juste sur les modalités pratiques de, de cette semaine qui s'annonce exceptionnelle. Euh, un grand merci à l'UMCP, à, à ses dirigeants, de, de rendre ça possible parce que j'espère que vous êtes conscients que c'est un, un moment privilégié que nous vivons euh, actuellement. Donc euh, en ce qui concerne le, le déroulement de, de la semaine, ah, je dois appuyer quelque part, pardon. Donc, très rapidement, nous, av nous avons concocté un, un programme scientifique très important, très dense. Profitez-en. Nous avons également, euh, cette année, pensé à la dimension culturelle. Euh, je vais vous donner le, le programme dans un instant. Euh, quand vous sortirez d'ici, vous avez remarqué qu'il y a des stands sous la pergola. Ce sont les stands des différents départements de l'université qui montrent chacun de manière à vous séduire ce qui se passe dans, dans, dans leur mur. Il y a des choses très très intéressantes à voir qui pourront vous donner des idées. Comme l'idée c'est également de casser les silos entre les disciplines, vous pourrez peut-être trouver des choses qui peuvent vous inspirer pour travailler ensemble. Euh, nous avons deux lieux pour les conférences. Nous avons l'auditorium dans lequel nous sommes, Ibn Rushd, et il y a une session en parallèle qui commence à partir de cet après-midi dans la salle Fatima Feria. Donc regardez bien sur le programme, il y a deux bandes, une pour le l'auditorium et une pour le, la salle Fatima Ferrier. Euh, ensuite, pardon, donc je vous parlais du programme culturel. Euh, à partir de mercredi, nous aurons un récital de Giovanni Bellucci, qui est un pianiste spécialiste de Beethoven, qui va venir jouer la Hammer Clavier en relation avec une performance faite par Reda Benkiran sur le, le, le thème de la complexité. Jeudi, nous aurons le, la chorale de l'UM6P, dont un certain nombre d'entre vous font partie, qui est organisée par la professeure Ikram Shahiri, entre autres prof de machine learning. Donc elle va peut-être mettre en place une, une machine automatique pour l'année prochaine. Mais pour l'instant, on a des vrais choristes. Et enfin, vendredi, on finit en apothéose avec euh, Hamid Qasri, que vous connaissez certainement, qui va donner une, un concert de musique gnawa pour euh, relaxer tout le monde. Le dernier point que je voulais évoquer avec vous, vous avez peut-être remarqué qu'il y a une librairie comme l'année dernière et donc l'initiative revient au, au management parce qu'on aime les livres et parce qu'on aime le savoir. Donc il y a une petite règle très très simple, les livres sont réservés aux étudiants et euh, vous êtes limité, c'est-à-dire que vous ne pouvez prendre qu'un seul livre et il y a quelque chose à la clé, les, les livres sont offerts. Et quand vous prendrez un livre, vous laisserez votre nom parce qu'on veut s'assurer que vous allez lire les livres. Et donc on vous demandera de faire une restitution, soit individuelle, soit en groupe, euh, vers, juste après Ramadan. Donc vous aurez tout le mois de Ramadan pour lire le, le livre que vous aurez choisi. Et ensuite vous partagerez avec vos camarades ce que vous en avez retenu. Et vous remarquerez en fait, pardon, le, dans la sélection des livres qu'il y a, il y a un certain nombre d'auteurs qui sont présents ici c'est une, une aubaine, c'est pas des gens qu'on croise tous les jours au coin de la rue donc profitez-en, et je voudrais conclure, pardon, alors c'est pas grave je voudrais conclure en, en parlant des deux livres qui viennent de sortir, donc on a publié les actes de la semaine de la science de l'année dernière et le livre de Reda Bunkiran euh, Complexité, vertige et promesses dans lequel vous retrouverez 18 histoires 18 entretiens qu'il a fait avec des scientifiques autour du thème de la complexité, dont encore une fois un certain nombre d'entre eux sont avec nous. Donc je vous souhaite une bonne semaine. Si vous avez des questions, des remarques ou, ou des propositions à faire, il y a une adresse mail wos.umcsp.ma. Donc euh, partagez avec nous vos demandes. Et bien entendu, comme on est au 21e siècle et que vous êtes tous jeunes, n'oubliez pas de taguer vos photos euh, sur Instagram, etc., avec le compte UMCSP. Merci. Thank you, Saad. Thank you, Rida. 
before giving the floor to Edgar Morin, Mr. Complexity, and uh, to uh, Stephen Wolfram, who is officially a genius, I'll explain later why. Um, I would like to um, give the floor virtually to uh, Professor Tawana Coupe, who is the Vice Chancellor of the University of Pretoria, because today we are launching a fund called the Louise Fresco Fund for Academic Mobility in Africa, and the, two, the first uh, universities who participate in the fund are U UM6P, who will host actually the fund, and University of Pretoria. So um, if you can start uh, Mr. Tawana Coupe speech, thank you. It is an honor for the University of Pretoria in South Africa to be part of this prestigious annual event, the Mohammed VI Polytech University UM6P Science Week, which is dedicated to developing Africa's social and economic potential. For Africa to fulfill this potential, it is vital for thought leaders across the continent, from the north to the south and from east to west, to work together crossing boundaries of all kinds to exchange knowledge, share innovations, and open up new frontiers for development. UM6P exemplifies the quest to cross boundaries, whether educational, scientific, geographical, or disciplinary. As we celebrate the opening of this third edition of the UM6P Science Week, congratulations are due to the university leadership together with leaders in the government of Morocco, the scientific community and industry on your vision of offering distinctly African perspectives on pressing global issues. In particular, I would like to acknowledge the president of the university, Dr. Hisham El Abbi, the president of the OCP group, Dr. Mustaf Terabi, the minister of higher education, science, scientific research and innovation, Mr. Abdilataf Miro, and the governor of the Rama province, Mr. Aziz Boigane. Further, the Investor Pretoria team also looks forward with excitement to the keynote addresses to be delivered by, among others, the acclaimed philosopher, Edgar Morin, and the celebrated scientist and physicist, Stephen Wolfram. Today, we also have the privilege of inaugurating the Louis Fresco Fund for Academic Mobility in Africa, initiated and created by Professor Louis Fresco, who is renowned for her work on globally sustainable food production. Sustainable food production is fundamental to the future stability and prosperity of the African continent, and is a matter of paramount importance, both to the UM6P and the University of Pretoria so much so that our two universities are choosing to build our collaboration around sustainable agriculture, food and rural development, with the LF Fund serving as a crucial link. This is an exceptionally important collaboration because it is a powerful demonstration of African unity and solidarity. Through this collaboration, two leading nations from Francophone and Anglophone Africa, respectively, are crossing boundaries and linking up in the search for sustainable solutions for our continent. As evidence of our commitment, a significant investment is being made in this collaborative work. Professor Fresco is donating the prize money that she received as part of the Justus von Liebenberg Award to the LF Fund. In turn, the University of Pretoria, together with other partners, will match the donation so that a sizable fund can be created. The partners in this collaboration are eager to begin work, and with this in mind, the University of Pretoria hereby invites the leadership of UM6P and OCP to visit Pretoria in May to consolidate the collaboration arrangements. We have no doubt that, like UM, 6P Science Week, which has gone from strength to strength, the collaboration will bear bountiful fruit for Africa. I'm looking forward to sending scholars to Morocco from South Africa and welcoming Moroccan scholars to South Africa. Thank you very much. I wish you happy deliberations.
Thank you. Okay, uh, now uh, we come to uh, the crux of the matter with uh, two uh, keynote speeches. The first, the first one will be given by Edgar Morin, Monsieur Complexité. Uh, the title is Le Défi des Complexités en Temps de Crise. We need it as uh, more as ever. Monsieur Morin, la parole est à vous. Est-ce que vous voulez rester assis Vous venez ici Vous venez ici. Bravo. Bonsoir, monsieur. Chers amis et collègues, mesdames et messieurs, je vais vous traiter du problème des crises, mais au préalable, comme l'a demandé très justement mon ami Benkera, euh, Berada Reda, je, je mets mon exposé sous l'égide de Jean-Louis Lemoigne, le grand maître qui a porté la systémique à son accomplissement et qui a joint la complexité et qui fut mon ami et mon frère pendant des années. Bon, cela étant dit, puisque j'ai parlé de la systémique, je dois préciser une chose. Alors que la théorie des systèmes complexes est une théorie qui s'occupe des systèmes dont les processus sont tellement liés et intérêts, inter en interaction qu'il est très difficile de prévoir leur devenir et leurs résultats. Moi, je dirais que tout système, quel qu'il soit, est complexe. D'abord, je dirais que tout ce que nous considérons comme objet est un système. Un atome est un système de particules, une molécule est un système de atomes, un être vivant est un système de molécules, ben, etc., etc. Autrement dit, tout ce qui se présente comme objet est une organisation faite d'éléments différents les uns des autres. Or, ce qui est tout à fait remarquable, déjà d'une façon populaire, on avait dit « le tout est beaucoup plus que la somme des parties », mais d'une façon systémique, on peut dire que le tout organisé produit des qualités et des propriétés qui ne sont pas dans les parties et qui sont les émergences. Ainsi, par exemple, pour prendre l'eau, H2O, l'eau a des propriétés que n'a pas l'hydrogène et que n'a pas l'oxygène et qui lui sont propres. Un être humain a des qualités et des propriétés spirituelles et culturelles que n'ont pas simplement ses organes biologiques. Autrement dit, et c'est ça la ruine de tout réductionnisme, on ne peut comprendre un système que si l'on comprend la relation entre tout et partie. Pourquoi aussi C'est parce que le tout peut très bien inhiber des qualités propres à des parties. Par exemple, un système dictatorial inhibe les qualités et les propriétés des individus. Cela étant dit, je pense qu'il y a, disons, quatre sortes de complexité. Il y a la complexité empirique des processus complexes, des théories des systèmes complexes. Il y a la complexité empirique du fait que les connaissances énormes qu'ont accumulées les disciplines se trouvent compartimentées les unes par rapport aux autres et dès qu'il s'agit de traiter un problème important comme Qu'est-ce que la mondialisation Qu'est-ce que l'homme Qu'est-ce que la mort Que ça Nous avons à ce moment-là l'impossibilité de relier ces connaissances. Donc, 
l'objet, un des objets empiriques de la connaissance complexe, c'est ce que j'ai appelé la reliance, la, capable, la capacité de relier des connaissances séparées pour traiter un objet important. D'autre part, la complexité a un caractère logique. Je viens de vous le montrer en parlant d'émergence. Ça veut dire qu'il est impossible de détruire par la logique les qualités du tout à partir des qualités des parties. Donc, ce problème logique, nous allons le retrouver dans l'apparition des contradictions au cours d'une investigation rationnelle. Par exemple, en microphysique, on a découvert qu'il était impossible de définir la particule sinon à la fois comme corpuscule et comme onde, ce qui sont deux notions complètement contradictoires. Mais en fait, comme l'a bien montré Niels Bohr, le grand fondateur de cette théorie microphysique, cette chose peut se retrouver aussi ou à l'autre niveau. Si vous regardez l'individu, vous ne voyez plus la société. Si vous regardez la société, vous ne voyez plus l'individu. Si vous regardez l'espèce, vous ne voyez plus l'individu. Si vous voyez l'individu, vous ne voyez plus l'espèce. Or, ces réalités sont inséparables l'une de l'autre et selon des processus qui, où la causalité n'est pas simple puisque l'espèce c'est-à-dire l'ADN produit les individus qui sont les produits de cette cause, mais les individus en s'accouplant produisent l'espèce en produisant des enfants, c'est-à-dire que nous sommes des produits producteurs. La société, avec ses émergences qui sont la culture et le langage, nous aide à produire les individus, mais les individus, de par leur interaction, produisent la société. Nous sommes des produits et des producteurs. La cause et les faits sont liés et ne sont pas linéaires. C'est comme dans un système de chauffage où vous avez un thermostat qui détermine la température idéale et qui, dont l'effet revient sur la cause qui est le chauffage. Et tout ceci crée l'autonomie interne du système. Alors, j'en viens à une dernière idée est très importante aussi, c'est l'idée d'auto-organisation, qui est le propre des êtres vivants. Or, cette auto-organisation a besoin, par la dépense d'énergie qu'elle produit, de s'alimenter à l'extérieur. Nous dépendons de la nourriture, le, les plantes dépendent du soleil pour produire euh, euh, avec la chlorophylle. Donc, donc, si vous voulez vous produire leur énergie, nous avons besoin de l'extérieur. Autrement dit, toute autonomie est en même temps dépendance. C'est-à-dire qu'il y a un lien entre deux notions apparemment contradictoires. Alors, cela étant dit, quand vous prenez, je prends un dernier exemple avant d'aborder les crises, si vous prenez la réalité humaine, qu'il est d'ailleurs très importante de connaître pour traiter les crises, vous vous rendez compte que non seulement nous sommes à la fois individus, partie d'une société, élément d'une espèce, c'est-à-dire dans une, dans une trinité inséparable, mais en même temps, nous sommes des êtres à la fois rationnels et délirants, capables de passion et de folie. Nous sommes des êtres capables de technique et nous sommes capables de mythologie et d'invention purement idéale, imaginaire. Nous sommes capables de vivre pour notre intérêt personnel et nous sommes capables de dépenser et de vivre pour autrui au détriment de notre sentiment. 
cette complexité humaine, elle va se révéler au cours des crises. Vous avez quand même, prenez par exemple l'idée d'arriver d'Hitler au pouvoir, le parti nazi était un tout petit parti périphérique et à l'occasion d'une crise euh, énorme économique, la masse de ceux qui votaient socialistes ou communistes ont voté Hitler et ont porté au pouvoir. Et ce petit parti dont tout le monde pensait qu'il était insignifiant a joué ce rôle énorme dans l'histoire. Donc, là-bas, voilà quelques aspects sur lesquels de la propre à l'humanité sur lequel nous allons revenir. Alors maintenant, avant de parler des crises, il faut interroger la notion même de crise. Bon. La notion est bien. Vous savez que dans l'Antiquité, on appelait crise ce qui permet le diagnostic. Or, aujourd'hui, on appelle crise ce qui rend incertain le diagnostic. Qu'est-ce qui va se passer Il y a une crise ministérielle. Quel va être le prochain gouvernement Il y a une crise de la pandémie. Qu'est-ce qui va arriver Etc. Donc, vous avez cet élément d'incertitude propre à toute complexité. Mais essayons de décider ce qu'est une crise d'un point de vue systémique. Une crise est une rupture dans le système de régulation d'un système qui permet de, rele, de refouler les déviances. Dans une société organisée, les déviances, que ce soit les criminalités, que ce soit les délinquances, sont réprimées et reposées. Bon. Quand arrive une crise, le système de régulation, pour une raison ou d'une autre, est atteint et dégradé, et ce qui était déviance tente à se transformer en tendance. Le système se détraque et nous ne savons pas s'il arrivera à se reconstituer, à se transformer ou du moins à plus ou moins se replacer. Donc, au cours d'une crise, que se va-t-il se produire La crise va développer d'un côté des processus d'invention et d'imagination capables de trouver une solution nouvelle à la crise. La crise, par contre, va développer au contraire des régressions, la recherche d'un sauveur, la recherche d'un coupable, un coupable souvent imaginaire, on va dire c'est l'immigrant, c'est l'étranger, on va chercher un coupable. Autrement dit, la crise est à la fois la manifestation d'une possibilité d'erreur et d'illusion incroyable et en même temps une possibilité de créativité nouvelle. Cela étant dit, nous allons aborder les crises, ces crises, la tragédie, c'est qu'elles se combinent et se multiplient les unes les autres. Vous savez, à partir du moment 1945, de la bombe d'Hiroshima, où le sort de toute l'humanité s'est trouvé menacé éventuellement par un conflit nucléaire, on peut dire que l'humanité est entrée dans une crise latente, crise latente que peuvent réveiller un peu des phénomènes comme pendant la guerre froide, la crise des fusées du Cuba, bon, ou autre. Vous avez aussi la crise de la mondialisation, d'une mondialisation qui s'est faite essentiellement sur une base techno-économique, 
et qu'il a suffi que la poésie arrive pour qu'il y ait une rétraction des nations les unes sur les autres et pour que, avec en plus l'arrivée de la guerre d'Ukraine, il y a une perturbation dans l'ensemble des communications qui constituaient la mondialisation et on peut se demander si on arrive à une régression de la mondialisation et jusqu'à jusqu quand et dans, dans quel domaine. Ce qui est intéressant dans la crise issue de la pandémie, c'est que ce n'est pas été seulement une crise médicale, une crise provoquée par l'absence de, de masques au départ ou l'absence de, de remèdes euh, connus. Euh, Ce n'était pas seulement une, une, une crise où la médecine la plus avancée n'était pas capable de, de, de traiter un virus d'un type nouveau qui était le coronavirus, lequel en plus n'a pas cessé de se muter et de provoquer de, nouveau, de nouvelles maladies. C'est que cette crise médicale a provoqué une crise sociale. L'enfermement a pu produire des crises domestiques chez les ménages et dans les familles. Il a produit des crises dans la perte de la relation directe de chacun avec son travail. Il a produit des effets multiples sur le plan social, politique, économique. Et cette crise de la pandémie est arrivée au moment où se déchaînait depuis les années 70 du siècle passé, c'est-à-dire depuis le rapport Windows, de bon, au moment où se déchaînait la crise de la planète, qui n'est pas seulement la destruction de la biosphère, qui, est aussi, qui a aussi des effets délétères sur la civilisation et l'humanité, avec les énormes pollutions urbaines, avec la pollution des lacs, des rivières, des océans, avec la pollution des terres sous l'industrie industrielle, le, pardon, sur l'agriculture industrielle qui stérilise les sorts et produit des effets parfois néfastes à cause des pesticides. La crise, disons, écologique a produit quand même des effets de plus en plus inquiétants aggravé par la crise climatique que nous pouvons vivre depuis deux ans et particulièrement cette année. Donc, nous sommes confrontés en tant que nation, en tant qu'humanité, à cette crise et l'humanité n'a pas les moyens de les traiter. L'ONU est impuissante, les réunions entre les États aboutissent à de très faibles résultats. Il n'y a pas d'autorité capable de traiter cette crise. Et voilà qu'éclate l'année dernière la guerre d'Ukraine, cette guerre qui au début est localisée. On se rend compte très vite qu'en réalité, elle est territorialement localisée mais elle est déjà économiquement mondialisée avec les sanctions provoquées contre la Russie, et économiquement mondialisée avec toutes les conséquences de la répaction des pétroles et du gaz qui provenaient des pays nordiques, et nous le rendons compte, notamment en Afrique, des conséquences désastreuses aussi de cette crise. Donc, quels sont les pouvoirs imaginatifs Quels sont les pouvoirs créatifs Quelles sont les organisations capables de traiter Pour le moment, non. Est-ce qu'on voit à l'horizon la possibilité d'une paix en Ukraine Objectivement, les conditions semblent favorables. 
les armées sont de force égale, il n'y a pas de compétition de l'un de l'autre, il faudrait trouver des compromis, des négociations, comme souvent dans les guerres, mais les deux adversaires sont décidés à aller jusqu'au bout, jusqu'à présent, et malgré les conditions objectives, les conditions subjectives. Donc, nous voici l'humanité en 2023 en proie à des crises qui s'entretiennent les unes les autres et où une guerre qui maintient son escalade avec les dernières nouvelles, c'est que des pays occidentaux vont livrer des avions à l'Ukraine, donc capables d'atteindre la Russie. La Chine va apporter une aide militaire à la Russie. Nous avons des signes de plus en plus inquiétants. Et de plus, dans un petit livre où j'ai voulu donner mon expérience de centenaire, j'ai vécu et j'ai participé à la Deuxième Guerre mondiale en tant que résistant. J'ai très bien connu dans ma jeunesse la Première Guerre mondiale et tous les mensonges de guerre qui se sont déployés et de toutes les illusions qui sont nées. J'ai vu aussi les mensonges, par exemple, la Russie niant qu'un massacre de Polonais à Katyn a été fait par elle et l'attribuant aux Allemands. La guerre développe l'illusion, la propagande, la haine de l'ennemi, pas seulement de l'armée ennemie, la haine euh, du peuple ennemi. Donc toute une série de symptômes catastrophiques. Et donc le vrai problème aujourd'hui, c'est la prise de conscience. Vous me demanderez les relèves. Hey, je ne peux pas les sortir de ma poche. Il n'y a pas de remède. Il y a d'abord les prises de conscience. Il faut prendre tout poussé par tous les moyens, les autorités à traiter le problème de la biosphère, c'est-à-dire de l'écologie planétaire. Il faut, par tous les moyens, que les citoyens et les citoyennes poussent de tous leurs mouvements pour une nouvelle mondialisation qui ne soit pas seulement de la technique, mais qui soit de la solidarité humaine. Il faut prendre conscience que toute l'humanité vit maintenant une communauté de destin. C'est toute l'humanité qui est menacée par le péril écologique, c'est toute l'humanité qui a été menacée par la pandémie, c'est toute l'humanité qui est provoquée, même menacée par la crise économique, c'est toute l'humanité qui est provoquée par le processus du déchaînement effréné du profit sur le monde qui aggrave les inégalités et qui crée de nouveaux problèmes, c'est toute l'humanité qui va souffrir de la guerre d'Ukraine. Donc, prise de conscience indispensable à tout renouveau. Voilà, si vous voulez, mon message. Maintenant, ce que je peux vous dire en terminant, c'est que si des participants ont des questions à me poser, ils pourront le faire par écrit et moi je pourrais revenir selon les organisateurs un jour prochain pour répondre à vos questions si que je ne les ai pas assez bien traitées aujourd'hui. Je vous remercie de votre attention. Merci, merci cher Edgar. Attendez. Allez-y. Vous allez. Merci, euh, cher Edgar Morin. Euh, <coughs> euh, donc, je, pense, je passe maintenant la parole au deuxième keynote speaker, qui est Monsieur Steven Wolfram.
just uh, wake my computer up here. I've signed up to talk about uh, foundations and implications of complexity. It's, uh, uh, it's, I've been working on complexity for um, about 45 years now, which seems like a long time to me, but I'm uh, pleased to be in a situation where I always used to, I started my career quite young, so I was often the youngest speaker at a conference by some 40 years or something. I thought that would never happen to me again. I'm very happy that this morning that's happened. So, the, all right, let's, let's talk about complexity and uh, what I see it as meaning, some of its foundations and implications. So, uh, I started off being involved in physics and being interested in how phenomena happen in the world. And uh, if we look at kind of the history of science, I think we can break kind of the explanations of things in the world into a, a series of epochs. The first one, probably in antiquity, was the question of sort of what are things made of? How do we describe what things are made of? Are things made of atoms? Are things made of other kinds of things? What, what are things made of? Many fields of science are still in the stage of basically just describing what are things made of. Then, in the 1600s, a big sort of advance was this idea of kind of a formal description of how things worked, using in particular ideas from mathematics. The notion that it wasn't just a question of what things were made of, it was a question of what a formal theory of what those things might be, something that could be described using mathematical equations. And the whole approach of using mathematical equations became sort of a defining feature of exact science. It was very successful in studying celestial mechanics, in studying all sorts of things which have led to modern engineering. 
And so by, by some time in the, when I got involved in these things in the late 1970s, early 1980s, uh, in a sense, exact science was almost defined by being something about which there could be mathematical equations. So the question that, that I got interested in was, okay, we, we see in the natural world all of these complex phenomena. How can we explain them? Can we, for example, write down mathematical equations which describe these phenomena? Well, I tried to do that. Didn't work very well. I knew all these fancy methods from theoretical physics, tried to apply them to these complex phenomena. They didn't really seem to apply. So the question then was, well, what else could one do? If one's going to make a theory for things, how can one base one's theory if it isn't on mathematical equations? That had been the tradition for 300 years to, to do that. So I thought, what, what if one is going to have a theory of things, it better be the case that the things one is describing are ultimately governed by some kind of underlying rules. What might those rules be like? In mathematical equations, we have particular rules with derivatives and integrals and all kinds of things from mathematics. What is the sort of general case of describing things by rules? And conveniently, in our times, there is a paradigm for thinking about those things and its computation. When we think about computer programs, we're thinking about a way of specifying what will happen by giving a series of rules. When we write computer programs, we tend to be used to writing programs where we imagine the purpose of the program and we write down individual pieces of the program specifically to engineer it for a particular purpose. But what I got interested in in the early 1980s was the question of, well, what if one generalized from mathematical equations and said the natural world could use any of those rules which corresponded to computer programs and then what kinds of programs might the natural world be using? And so that led to a, a basic science question, which is, if you just look at programs, you pick programs at random, and you ask, what do they do? What will the, what will the results of that be? And this is a field of science that I think in many ways is sort of, perhaps one could even argue, the most fundamental field of science. I'll talk perhaps a bit about how it sort of underlies even the things that we think about, about the foundations of mathematics and so on. But this idea of just pick rules and see what they do. It's a field I now tend to call ruleology. Okay, so, so what happens if we do that? Well, let's, let's um, here, let me just, uh, what, one of the nice things about, um, about modern times is that, um, is this, oh yeah, we can see it, good, good, good. Um, is uh, we, can, we can do everything in real time. So if I, if I were to, uh, let's talk about a particular uh, kind of rule that I've studied a lot. These are things called cellular automata. A very simple way of being set up. It's just a line of cells. Each cell is either black or white. And then what happens is, as you go in a series of steps, the color of a cell is determined by the color of the cell immediately above it and to its left and right. So this is a a rule that says what the color of the cell underneath should be based on the colors of the cells above it. So now we can ask the question, okay, what, what does this, uh, uh, what happens if we just run this rule for a little while? We can just say, um, uh, let's just do that. Let's start it off from a single black cell here. Let's run it for, I don't know, 40 steps or something. What we get is something very simple. We start off from a, a single black cell, and with this particular rule, all we get is a simple pattern. So we had a simple rule, we get simple behavior. Let's try a different rule. Let's say we use uh, this rule here. Let's change this here. Okay, again, a simple rule, simple behavior. We might think, our intuition might be, if the rule is simple, the behavior must always be somehow correspondingly simple. Let's try another rule. Okay, this one is, uh, again, very simple rule. But what it produces is a pattern that's a little bit more elaborate, more intricate. Eventually, it makes a nested fractal pattern. OK, so one thing one can then ask is one can kind of go out in this kind of computational universe of possible programs, and one can ask, what is out there? What possible behaviors can occur? And it's kind of fun to sort of redo an experiment that I did many years ago now. Um, it's, uh, uh, and just look at all possible rules of a particular kind. Uh, we're just looking at all possible rules that are set up with black and white cells in this way. So let's look at, let's say, the first 64 of them. Here they are. So each one of those pictures corresponds to a different rule for determining what will happen. In a sense, a, sense, a different rule for an artificial universe, so to speak. So most of the time, it's true that one's intuition is right. A simple rule produces simple behavior. Keep going, keep going a little bit longer. And then we get rule 30 my all-time favorite science discovery, this thing here. Let's look at a bigger version of this. Let's say we, we run rule 30 
uh, let's say for 400 steps, I'll show you what rule 30 is here, there's the rule, this is what it does. So to me, this is a very remarkable thing, because you might say, well, simple rule will get simple behavior. Our experience in doing engineering is that if we want to make something complicated, we have to go to a lot of trouble, we have to have complicated plans, we have to set the thing up in a, in a complicated way. But here what we're getting is this extremely simple rule, we just started off from one black cell there, produces this pattern that looks very complicated. It has a certain amount of regularity over on the left, but for example, if we trace the center cells in this pattern, we'll find that for all practical purposes, they seem to us completely random. So this is sort of a remarkable phenomenon, that even, even though the rules can be simple, the behavior that's generated is very complicated. And the, what, what does this mean? Well, it sort of breaks out of the intuition that we've had that's been the intuition that we get from our engineering and our other kinds of activities. It tells us that actually out in this computational universe of possible programs, it's actually very easy to get a great deal of complexity. And the thing that to me was very exciting about this is I think this is kind of the secret that nature uses to make all the complexity that we see. It's, a, it's at least, well, m most of the complexity that we see. We'll, we'll talk about that a bit, bit more later. But, but um, so that in this sort of computational universe of programs, it's, it's easy to get programs where even though the program is simple, the behavior will be complicated. And we can go and look at all sorts of different particular examples of this playing out in different kinds of, of systems in nature um, where, where this occurs. Okay, so what, what's the significance of this for, for, for science in general? One thing one might ask is, well, one of the things that's sort of a, a triumph of the equation-based science of the 1600s and so on, is this idea that you can kind of computationally reduce one's understanding of a system. So for example, you're studying the motion of planets or something, and you're asking where will the Earth be a million years from now as it orbits around some idealized sun? Well, you could trace those million orbits and just see orbit by orbit what happens, but we know we can just make a formula into which we plug the number of million and we get the answer. In other words, we've been able to come up with a computationally reduced way to describe how the system behaves. We don't have to follow every step to see what happens. Question is, is that a general thing? Is this idea of prediction, this idea of us being able to kind of jump ahead and computationally reduce what has to be done, is that a general feature of science or is that something particular to the science that happened to emerge from what was done with mathematics in the 1600s? I think it is not a general feature of science. And for example, this Rule 30 uh, cellular automaton system is almost certainly an example of a phenomenon I call computational irreducibility. If you want to know what is going to happen, a very large number of steps in the future, you can clearly find that out by just explicitly evolving the system and seeing what it does. The question is, can you jump ahead? Can you, the human scientist, be somehow smarter than the system and be able to jump ahead and see what it will do without having to trace each step to see explicitly what happens? Well, the, the, this phenomenon of computational irreducibility is a consequence of kind of a, a fundamental principle that I think is a very useful principle for understanding a lot of things about, about the world. It's a thing I call the principle of computational equivalence. So when, when you look at some phenomenon like this, uh, uh, any process in nature and you say it's following rules, it's generating some output, one thing in modern times that we can think about is that this process is effectively performing a computation. It's been given some input, it's given some computational rules, it will generate some output. So one of the questions is, if we look at all these different computations done by systems like Rule 30, done by systems in nature, how do these computations compare? Are some computations more sophisticated than others? How does that work? Well, one of the things that was discovered in the 1920s, 1930s, is the idea of universal computation. The idea that there exist particular systems that have the property that if you feed them appropriate initial conditions, initial data, they can do any computation that any system can do. That idea has been tremendously important in technology. It's what makes software possible. It's basically what's made the whole computer revolution possible. But that idea also has significance in science. And I think one of the things that, that what the question then is, is this phenomenon that you can find systems that have this property of universality and so on, is that something very special? Do we have to go and build a special CPU chip to be able to get a universal computer or not? The principle of computational equivalence says that actually the, 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 there isn't, uh, that, that in a sense, computational sophistication is ubiquitous. 
above some very low threshold, essentially every system you look at that is not obviously simple in its behavior will be equivalent in its computational sophistication. So one consequence of that is that lots of systems in nature will be computationally universal, has another consequence, which is the phenomenon of computational irreducibility. Why does that happen? Well, what would we be doing if we say, okay, this Rule 30 system, it goes through a million steps to work out what it's going to do, but we can be cleverer than it. We can figure out in some computationally reduced way what's going to happen. Well, for us to be cleverer than it, we in a sense have to be computationally more sophisticated than it is. But this principle of computational equivalence says that all these different systems in the world, whether they're these Rule 30 systems or our brains or whatever, are, are all computationally equivalent. So in a sense, we can never systematically win the competition of us being able to work out what's going to happen faster than it happens. Now you might say, so one, one thing that that means is there are limitations to science. There are things that the, the traditional science of the 1600s and so on, mathematical science, will not be able to capture. There are things where we won't know what's going to happen other than by essentially running the system and seeing what happens. You might say, so it's a, that's a significant thing for science because it's a way in which there's a limit, fundamental limitation on science that is emerging from within science. But it's in a sense, it's, a, it's for us, I suppose, in, in living our lives, it's kind of a good thing because it's kind of what gives us the idea that sort of the passage of time is significant. If it was the case that we could just say, oh, we know what the outcome of all of this passage of time that we go through is, the answer is 42 or something, then we wouldn't, there would be sort of nothing achieved by the passage of time. What computational irreducibility implies is that there is something sort of fundamentally achieved by the passage of time. There is some computational process which is building up over the course of time. Okay, so that, that uh, j just to sort of outline the... Um, uh, this, this sort of idea of um, uh, the, the, um, the sort of periods of, of the development of science. You know, in, the, in, the, in antiquity, we have kind of, uh, kind of a structural description of things. In, in the 1600s, we have this kind of mathematical description of things. Now we have this kind of computational description of things. One thing that differs in those descriptions is the role of time. In the structural description, there isn't really, time isn't really involved, it's just what are things made of. In the mathematical description, time exists, but it's kind of just a variable. You can just turn a knob and say, I want to get the answer at any time in the future. By the time we're dealing with the computational paradigm, time is something more significant. We can't work out what's going to happen in the future except by irreducibly going through these computational steps. So that's kind of a, a way to distinguish those three periods and, and, and to understand that there are things that will not be achievable by science in this sort of third period of computation because of computational irreducibility. So you might say that's kind of a downer. That means that there are sort of limitations on what one, what one can do in science. Um, one of the things that has emerged in the last few years, for me at least, is a realization that there's another level, there's a sort of fourth epoch in the development of theoretical science um, which actually recovers some of what we lost in computational irreducibility. So let me talk a little bit about that. So a thing I was long interested in is the question other people have been interested in also of kind of what uh, might there be a, a fundamental theory of physics? Might there be kind of a, a, uh, a fundamental um, uh, underlying structure to the physical world? And the question is, once you've seen things like Rule 30, you start wondering, could it be the case that everything we see in, in the physical world could similarly come from some simple computational rule just being run out for a long period of time and making everything that we see in the universe? Could that be the case? What might that rule be like? Well, it turns out that it can absolutely be the case, and I think we, we now know kind of at least an outline um, what that rule is like, and I can describe that a little bit. Let me just... Um, uh, show you something here. Um, maybe, okay. Oh, you can see that. Um, so, what I, this, this is um, a, to me, very remarkable breakthrough that, that um, we had in, in 2020 um, in trying to understand sort of what is underneath everything that exists in physics. And it's, people have wondered for a long time, is there a bottom level to what you can work out in physics? I think now we strongly believe that there is, and we know what it's like. 
And what's interesting is how that interfaces with kind of this notion of computational irreducibility. Maybe, maybe I should actually, uh, yeah, okay, so let me, let me try and describe this. So the, uh, uh, the, the first question, which is sort of a foundational one, is, is kind of what is the universe made of? And the, the, the thing that is most obvious about the universe is there's space in the universe. And people have thought since Euclid and so on, space isn't made of anything. It's just something you put things in and you place them at certain positions and so on. Well, we've learnt that lots of other stuff is made of things. We've learnt that materials are made of atoms. We've learnt that light is made of photons and so on. But still we think that space is just a thing that isn't made of anything. I think that's not correct. I think space is, is made of things. You can think of them as kind of atoms of space, these underlying elements that make up our physical universe. What can we say about these elements? Practically nothing. We can say only that an element exists and that it's distinct from other elements. And we say then that what we specify about these elements is how they're related. One element is related to other elements. So we have this giant collection of these elements and relations between elements. We can think about that as some kind of graph or hypergraph. And that hypergraph is a representation of sort of everything that exists in the universe. The structure of space and the contents of space as well. And we can think about sort of the content of space, electrons and particles and whatever else. It's a little bit like what happens in a fluid like water. At the lowest level, they're just a bunch of molecules. But when we see things like vortices in the water, uh, those, those are made from sort of the collective motion of lots of molecules. And so it is, I think, with space that things like electrons are made from kind of the, the, the structure of the particular structures in this hypergraph that represents the universe. The, and so the... Um, uh, so in any case, the, 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 the thing that, um, so the, this, uh, and there are many features, so when we look at, uh, for example, fluid dynamics, and we start off from the molecules, we know that from all these molecules bouncing around, we can derive the equations of fluid mechanics from, as, the, as the kind of large scale limit of what happens with all these individual molecules. The corresponding thing that happens in space is that we derive Einstein's equations for the structure of space-time and for gravity. That's the, that's the similar thing that happens from these, these, uh, these processes with these hypergraphs. Time in this model is something very distinct from space. It is the progressive computational rewriting of this hypergraph using rules that are, well, they're not the same as the rules for a cellular automaton, but it's the same kind of idea. You're just taking a piece of hypergraph and rewriting it to some other piece of hypergraph. And you keep doing that. It turns out that the mathematics works out so that all the expectations of relativity theory and the correspondences between space and time all emerge as a large-scale feature of this system. Okay, so it turns out that we can ask the question, uh, so what's actually happening in the system? At the lowest level, all these atoms of space are doing very complicated things. They are uh, they're sort of uh, interacting with each other in effect through this hypergraph. And the, the, the process that's going on there is one that shows lots of computational irreducibility. If we were down at the level of atoms of space, we would have no idea what was going on in the universe. We would, the only way we'd be able to work out what happens is by just following what the universe does. But the critical thing is that we are not operating down at the level of individual atoms of space. We, as observers of this universe, are operating on a much larger scale, and we have many limitations in what we can observe about the universe. So in a sense, all this activity is happening down at the level of atoms of space, but we are looking only at some very aggregated version of that activity. And it turns out that the aggregated version that we see has the feature that it shows the, the, what corresponds to continuum space and so on. There's a simple analogy. Let's go back to talking about molecules and, uh, uh, and, and things like gases and fluids and so on. If, if you're down at the level of individual molecules, you see all kinds of complicated behavior happening. When you look at a larger scale, you average that out and you see something which might correspond to something like a continuum fluid. So, the, the, and, and for example, one of the big results of looking at, the, at uh, what happens at the level of molecules is the second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy increase, and so on. Um, and that, that law is basically a consequence of the fact that we are observing what happens at the level of molecules. We're observing it as large-scale observers. We're not able to trace what happens at the level of individual molecules. 
in, in essence, what happens at the level of individual molecules is computationally irreducible, but we just get to see kind of an aggregated version of what's going on. We, we are kind of computationally bounded observers, and as computationally bounded observers, there's a, there's, we can only observe certain aspects of what happens in the system. And it turns out that for a computationally bounded observer, it is inevitable that when there is computational irreducibility, the second law of thermodynamics will be valid. That's, so in that case, turns out in the case of space-time, the very same thing happens. If you are a computationally bounded observer, and you have one more condition, the other condition is you're an observer who believes that they are persistent in time, which is not an obvious thing, because once you have an observer that is part of the universe, it's made from atoms of space like everything else, at every moment, the atoms in space of which the observer is made will be new atoms of space. The observer will be recreated at every moment in time. So it's not a trivial fact that the observer has the impression that they are uh, following a, a consistent thread of history. But if you have that impression and you are computationally bounded, then it turns out to follow that as a result of computational irreducibility of the underlying system, that is inevitable that you get the Einstein equations and you get the standard theory for space-time, which I consider very remarkable. More than that, you can go on and think about quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, what's important is that these rewritings of this hypergraph, there isn't just one possible path of rewriting. There's a whole, we call it a multi-way system, of, of many possible paths and joinings of, of this um, uh, of rewriting of the system. And that, that, that leads to sort of many possible histories for the universe. Well, the thing that is a complicated thing to think about is that we are observers embedded in that branching and merging universe. And so in a sense, the story of what we observe becomes a story of what does a branching brain observe about a branching universe. And it turns out again, that if that branching brain is computationally bounded and believes that there's a single thread of history, then it inevitably follows that that, that, that system must satisfy the standard laws of quantum mechanics. So it's kind of a remarkable thing because it means that it becomes possible to think about kind of deriving sort of basic physics, not as a matter of just the universe happens to work this way, but as a matter of something that is inevitable given the way that we are as observers of the system. I, I might say that, there's a, I, that, that we're descending into more and more sophisticated concepts, but the, the sort of the ultimate concept here is a thing that I call the Rouliad, which is a, a thing where when we're talking about something like the evolution of the universe and we say it follows a particular rule, you might say, well, which rule is it? And you might have, imagine a very strange situation, a sort of a Copernicus-like situation where you say, we found the rule for the universe, it's this particular one here. And then people will wonder, well, why isn't it one of these other many, many possibilities for rules? Why, why did we get this special rule? Well, what I think is the case is that in some sense the universe is running all possible rules that there's this thing I call the Rouliad, which is something where you're effectively running all possible uh, computational systems, and you're running them, the, you're kind of running each, imagine you have something like Turing machines, simple model of computation, you run all possible Turing machines from all possible initial conditions, you run it for an infinite time, you get this very complicated structure which involves things that branch from one Turing machine, ends up with two different states, those two states might merge together with different rules and so on. You get this very complicated structure. We are embedded in this structure, we are observers that are part of this structure. So everything that we experience is something that's based on kind of our way of parsing the structure, our particular slice taken from the structure. And so then the, the big result is that if we parse that structure, if we are observers who have these properties of computational boundedness and belief in persistence in time, then it follows that the way that we observe that structure inevitably must be one where we end up following these, these laws of physics that I've described. So I, I consider that a, a, an exciting thing because it allows us to kind of derive the, the fundamental laws of physics from something which is kind of a necessary uh, structure that doesn't introduce any kind of, uh, any, any kind of um, uh, anything where we, we sort of have a contingent fact about the world. I, I could go on and talk about how this Rouliad object also underlies mathematics. It also it represents all possible mathematical axiom systems. 
And you can also think about an observer of a system, just as we talk about the observer in physics, as having these attributes where the observer in physics is parsing out these particular features of the physical world. So similarly, there's a mathematical observer who parses out certain features of this metamathematical world to conclude things that are like the mathematics that we know. Okay, why is this relevant to complexity? The, the, the fundamental reason is that you might have, that this phenomenon of computational irreducibility is a ubiquitous phenomenon. Uh, all sorts of systems will exhibit it. Th that you might think that computational irreducibility would sort of mean it's the end of a certain kind of science. It's the end of being able to say much about what happens. But it isn't, because it turns out that even in the presence of lots of computational irreducibility, for an observer with certain characteristics, the observer is kind of sampling only those parts of the system for which there is predictability to be had. So in other words, one's turned the question of, of why, if we think about things starting from this Rouliad object, what's happening is different possible observers are, are sampling the Rouliad in different ways and concluding different things about what, what, what the kind of laws of the universe for them might be. And the fact, is, the point is that there are definite and reducible laws. There are essentially slices of reducibility that can be found in this otherwise irreducible system. What's the, what are the implications of that? Well, this, this underlying structure of the Rouliad is, I think, a very general thing. And all sorts of different fields, whether it's molecular biology, whether it's economics, um, whether it's uh, other kinds of things, I think we can see as being derived from the Rouliad, but by a different kind of observer. So for each different kind of field, there's a different type of observer, a different set of, of features that we can observe. And it is then a, a, a consequence of the features that we observe, what kinds of laws we get. So for example, let's say economics. It could be the case that there are, uh, there are, there's a type of economic observer who observes quite simple laws, even though the underlying system behaves in an irreducible way. Those laws might turn out to be of human use, they might not. They might be laws that are irrelevant, they're things that they, it, they might talk about, things that we humans don't care about. The fact is that in physics, there's this, what, what's happened is that the things that we sort of sense and care about are things that correspond to slices of reducibility in, in the Rouliad, and that's, that's kind of the alignment of, of observers like us exist in a way so that there is predictability for the things that we care about. Okay, I mention one more thing. So I said I would, would uh, get to sort of uh, current times. Um, the, uh, one of the things that there's this, oh, I, I actually should say another thing. I mean, in this kind of ranking of different epochs of scientific history, I think the thing that we have now reached is what I call multi-computational paradigm. It's kind of the fourth level after the computational paradigm where we have this notion of time as this thing that progresses as, as, a, as a matter of computation being executed. So in this multi-computational paradigm, we end up with a situation where there are many possible paths for time. And that has the feature that the only way one can make sense of what's going on is by having an observer. There's no, there's, the observer is a necessary feature of the system. There's nothing one can conclude without an observer. And so in this multi-computational paradigm, it's, it's kind of one, one's, one's reached another level and one can think about it in terms of the different treatment of time. Now there's not just a single thread of time, there are many possible threads of time, but then we have to make sense of things with an observer. Once we have an observer, we then end up being able to make conclusions which are uh, conclusions which involve computational reducibility. Well, okay, so, so we can think about kind of all of this, uh, there's this kind of ocean of computational possibility that's out there in which, for example, computational irreducibility is a common phenomenon. And the question is, we humans, much of what is out there in this sort of ocean of computational possibility, you know, is, is uh, uh, I don't know, we can make some, some picture of what, what happens out there. The question is, do we humans care about this? And the, the, the thing is that what we have reached as, as we, we can think about this as exploring the Rouliad, that we exist at some point in the Rouliad and that we are exploring kind of the, 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 the structure of what's possible in, around that area of the Rouliad. 
And the things that, there are certain things that we know we care about. There are certain things that are relevant to our senses. There are certain things that are relevant to the technology we build and so on. And there are other things where we look at it and we say, well, that's nice, but we don't, we don't care. That doesn't connect to anything that we do. So one of the things I've been long interested in is there's all this sort of ocean of possibility of what is computationally possible. How does that connect to what we humans think about? I've spent a large part of my life building a computational language, or Wolfram language, that uh, is, is an attempt to capture kind of what we humans care about, a way to represent what we humans care about as a computational language. It's kind of the analog back 500 years ago, sort of a, a big thing that happened was the invention of mathematical notation that allowed people to sort of talk in a streamlined way about mathematical ideas. And that led to the mathematical sciences and calculus and all those kinds of things. What, what I've been trying to do for many years is, and, and happily many people use what we've built around the world, um, the, uh, what, what I've been trying to do is to build a computational language which is kind of a notation for computation as mathematical notation is a notation for, for mathematics. And this computational language is, it is uh, the, a, a big part of it is representing things in the world that we care about, whether it's cities, whether it's certain kinds of algorithms, processes, and so on, having representations for those things. Much as in a human language, we make up words for things that we care about. We make up a word for chair. We make up a, a word for, for website or something. Um, we make up words for things out there in, in, the, in the world of possibilities. There are certain things that we care about. We give those words in our language. And in our computational language, the idea is to do the same thing, to describe the world computationally by essentially finding those, those words, those, those pieces of computational description. Okay, so just the, the um, so there's this kind of, there's this sort of what's out there that's computationally possible, that's what we care about as humans. One of the things that's sort of a, a thing of recent times is uh, the world of things like ChatGPT, and we've been involved in machine learning and AI and things for a long time. So this was, uh, ChatGPT was a big surprise to everybody, including the people who built it. Nobody thought it was going to work this well. And the question is, what, uh, let's see if I can find a, a picture here. Uh, let's see. Um, the, uh, um, here we go. Um, let's talk about, okay, here's a good one. Um, how does, okay, the, the, the question is, what do we learn? How does ChatGPT relate to all these questions about complexity? What does ChatGPT do? What ChatGPT does is it has one task. You give it a piece of text, and it will try and continue that text in a way that's reasonable based on all the text that it's seen from the web and a bunch of books. So in other words, it's trying to statistically continue what it saw so far based on probabilities that are derived from looking at a corpus of about four billion web pages and a few million books and things like this. So it's trying to do, it's trying to continue in a way that is sort of typical of what us humans have put on the web. So it's, 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 it's capturing what um, the, and, and it turns out, so it, it's got about a trillion words of, uh, of, of sample human output, that's a, a decent fraction of all the output that is publicly accessible from our species, so to speak, and as, as text. It's got those, those words. Inside it, it's essentially having to make a model for how to predict what the next word will be based on what it knows is out there in those trillion words. And the model it makes is, is using an idea that comes from the 1940s, the idea of neural nets, a, a simple idealization of how brains work. Um, and the neural nets, it, it's just, a, a, here are some examples of kind of a, a train, trained neural nets. Um, find, uh, uh, this, is, um, this is something where you're trying to get it to reproduce some function here where the, where the value is yellow when it's in this region, red when it's in this region, and so on. And these are the best, what, what you're doing is you're feeding in the X and Y coordinates here, and these are just uh, working out with the weights corresponding to the colors and so on, and a little threshold at every node. You're working out what the output will be, what, what will be the output color here. And um, uh, it turns out that you can take those trillion words on the web, and you can find out, you, you 
can figure out a neural net that's really quite good at predicting what the next word should be, it has about 175 billion connections in it. And that's, which is comparable to the number of words that it saw, and that seems to be not a surprise, but nobody really understands quite why. So what we're seeing is that, that something, that we've got this thing that is really like a cellular automaton, like many of these other systems, it's ultimately built of extremely simple components. It's just built of these simple artificial neurons. It happens to be a few million of them with 175 billion connections between them, but fundamentally they're, they're simple underlying components. And the thing which is a huge surprise is that a system like that can actually produce text that is very human-like text. And so the question is, why does that happen? And I think the answer is because actually producing human-like text is not as complicated as one thought. In other words, we imagine that, that sort of language is this sort of pinnacle of, of uh, the, the uh, operation of intelligence and so on. It's something very general. It's actually something that I think is fairly specific. And I think what we see is that what ChatGPT has basically discovered is something which is a sort of direct follow-on to what Aristotle was working on a long time ago. It's kind of regularities of the structure of meaning that we didn't happen to, we don't happen to know about. So I'll give you an example. So one thing that, um, that ChatGPT does is it implicitly learns, as if I have a picture of that, um, it implicitly learns, uh, you know, it implicitly learns the grammar of English, the syntactic grammar of English. It was never explicitly taught how to parse an English sentence into nouns and verbs and so on, but it implicitly learns them. If you try and teach it, for example, uh, something like a parenthesis language, a very simple language where you open and close parentheses, it will actually eventually fail to do this. It, it, it is, it's not, um, um, and what it's, what's happening is that what ChatGPT is doing is it's doing essentially shallow computations. It's doing, it's doing computations that are, well, okay, to, to explain in terms of computational irreducibility, one thing that it cannot do is irreducible computations. What, what happens when it runs is every new word it produces, it produces by just trickling through this neural net uh, a series of numbers and figuring out what the probabilities of the next word are. It never gets to even have a feedback loop. The only feedback loop it has is through, the origin, through adding a new word, then looking at all the words it's had so far, when it adds the next word, and so on. So, that means that the, all these processes that we've talked about in nature and so on that involve computational irreducibility, it doesn't get to do those things. So the surprise is that all this stuff that we thought was really complicated that has to do with how human language works doesn't involve computational irreducibility. Nature involves plenty of computational irreducibility, but in what we do when we make human language, we've taken a slice through things that involves only fairly shallow computationally reducible stuff. And what you, can, what you can ask is, well, how did we, you know, what are some analogies to, to, to how that works? And um, the, uh, I think, let's see, I had a nice picture here somewhere. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a picture of the sort of the insides of ChatGPT, of some of its, of uh, uh, sort of what it learns. And somewhere in there, that's sort of a representation of the regularities of human language and so on, and, and uh, the way that we think about things. But the thing that, um, uh, the, the, the thing to understand is it's generating language and the question is sort of what are the rules by which it generates language and there are two basic known kinds of rules one is the rules of syntax of, of grammatical syntax and so on um, that's, those are rules which it has implicitly learnt another type of rule is something like rules of logic and if we imagine you know, what was Aristotle doing back you know, a couple of thousand years ago what one way to think about what he was doing was he was looking at examples of rhetoric of speeches people gave and so on and he was asking what kinds of, uh, of structures were repeated in those speeches so you know uh, there might be you know all men are mortal Socrates is a man therefore Socrates is mortal that structure without Socrates and mortality is repeated over and over again and that structure is what Aristotle identified as syllogistic logic and so, in other words, there's this structure of meaning that is found repeatably. And so I think what's happening in, in ChatGPT is that it's basically finding generalizations of logic that are other sort of structures of meaning that exist in human language, which Aristotle actually started looking for, but very few people have looked for them since. 
And we're actually sort of in a unique position to find these things because of understanding about computational language, having the example of ChatGPT and so on. But so what it means is that, that what it's really doing is it's, it's, there is some sort of semantic grammar of language which represents not just the syntactic structure, but also something about the meaning of language. And what's happening is that it's managing to piece together things which are, which sort of fit together as puzzle pieces of semantically, things that are valid according to the semantic grammar, and that's kind of what it's generating. So, okay, so the, the, I, that, that, um, that's just an example of, uh, uh, well, what's interesting is, that it's another case where we humans have managed to find this slice of, of the world that doesn't involve deep computational irreducibility. By the way, when you, you know, if you use ChatGPT, um, you'll, uh, uh, you'll find out, you know, if you ask it to do math problems or something, it will confidently tell you an answer and the answer will be completely wrong usually. Um, and uh, uh, as you may know, we have this system called Wolfram Alpha, which takes natural language and does math problems by a very different method. It turns the natural language into our computational language. Then it uses kind of actual computation, which involves irreducibility and so on, to work out the answer. And of course, one can one can think about, and more than just think about, uh, connecting, you know, ChatGPT to Wolfram Alpha, so that it can use tools just like we humans use tools to do things like mathematical computation. It will be able to use tools too to be able to do that. But on its own, and the thing where it's representing what we seem to uh, have in, in language and so on, seems to be, again, one of these things where we have taken sort of a shallow slice through all computational possibilities. So, okay, I should, I should probably wrap up here. And um, uh, I think the, um, the thing that I sort of most wanted to communicate was a few, a few basic points. First, this, this discovery, this fact, that in the computational world, unlike in the world that we are used to from doing engineering or, for example, from doing uh, sort of mathematics, most kinds of mathematics, um, in the computational world, it's extremely common to have very simple underlying rules producing very complex behavior. That that's a generic thing, that that generic thing is a consequence of a deeper principle, this principle of computational equivalence, the principle of computational equivalence has all sorts of implications in both science and philosophy and other areas, but it is the thing that is the cause that we can think of as the reason that it is that we see the complexity we see is because there is that principle at work. So that's, and, and the, therefore the, the, the presence of computational irreducibility then provides this limitation to the kind of, of, of prediction in science that we've been familiar with for the last 300 years. Um, and uh, it's something where, uh, uh, right now, most of the technology we build is technology that assumes that we kind of understand how all the pieces work inside. And that's, a, that's something that is, the sort of bef is before computational irreducibility. Once you are dealing with computational irreducibility, you cannot expect to understand how all the pieces work inside. And in fact, if you ever want to use computation to its fullest extent, with its a, a maximally powerful way, then inevitably you won't understand what's going on inside because you have to have irreducible computation. And that applies to AIs, it applies to all sorts of other kinds of systems, that if you want it, you have this trade-off. You can either say, I'm going to understand what's going on inside, or you can say, I'm going to let the computation be as powerful as it can be, in which case you have computational irreducibility, and you have this limitation on prediction, on sort of science-style prediction. But so, in any case, the, the, um, uh, there's this sort of fundamental limitation, and that fundamental limitation makes one sort of start thinking about things in a slightly different way. You know, we think about what happens when AIs are doing everything in the world, and, uh, you know, we are, and we don't understand what's going on inside the AIs. And if the AIs are doing serious computation, we won't understand what's going on inside the AIs. What is that like? Actually, we have a lot of experience with that, because that's like our relationship with nature. Nature also is full of computational irreducibility, and we are just sampling pieces of what's going on. So in any case, the, the you know, fundamental idea of computational irreducibility, these limitations on the kinds of things that we can say um, and, and that we can predict, um, that we can, where we, the ways in which we can sort of be superior, we can, we can uh, to, to what happens in, in the natural world or the computational world. And then, 
And the final piece is this piece about multi-computational, the multi-computational paradigm, this idea of observers, this idea that observers like us can take slices of what's happening and have those show computational reducibility. And the, the science that we've done, we, we can think of it as, as, um, uh, as we kind of expand in this Rouliad, we can think about points in the Rouliad corresponding to different kinds of ways that we can observe what's going on. And as we increase, our, as we kind of expand our, our technology and our scientific paradigms, we get to sort of expand our domain in the Rouliad. Just like we expand our domain in physical space by sending out spacecraft, we expand our domain in the Rouliad by discovering more scientific paradigms and so on. And I think that, that, um, uh, that process of, um, uh, as we, uh, that, that process is a never-ending process. We can, it's rather easy to show that we will never run out of possible slices of computational reducibility. So there will always be places where we can make sort of scientific progress. Um, we'll never run out of that, but there'll also be lots of things about which we cannot make kind of the, the, the types of statements that we've been familiar with making. I, I just want to emphasize again that in fields like, let's say, economics and things like this, uh, I fully expect that the kinds of conclusions that we're able to make in physics will be carried, we will be able to carry over those conclusions. We'll be able to talk about things like event horizons and black holes and, and gravity and so on in things like an economic setting, but with respect to a kind of observer that may or may not correspond to an observer that's useful for our purposes in, in the way that we experience economics. Anyway, I should stop there, so thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. I will ask you a question, so maybe Please. you can just sit down next to, to Edgar. Edgar wants something, which is his bottle of water. Why don't you sit down there, Stephen? I will ask you a question. Um, thank you, Stephen, for, uh, for a very brilliant expose, matter of thought. <clears throat> thank you, Stephen, for making my life very difficult because now I have to rewrite entirely my lectures in history and philosophy of science. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I think there is a million questions that could be asked uh, of you by uh, the audience, but you are here for a while, so I think that people can just ambush you on the campus and ask you questions. En ce qui concerne la conférence uh, très inspirante de Edgar Morin, um, encore une fois, vous pouvez poser des questions par écrit, à Edgar Morin et nous allons le réinviter et il vous répondra donc euh, aux questions que vous lui posez par écrit. Alors, <coughs> maintenant on va passer à l'inauguration du Louis Fresco Fund for Academic Mobility in Africa. Je crois qu'il y a, euh, l'agence doit faire des manipulations, mettre une table là-bas, enfin des trucs assez compliqués. Euh, je vous propose donc euh, à ceux qui sont chargés de faire ces manipulations de le faire et I will abuse my position of Master of Ceremony, to ask one question to <laughs> Stephen. Um, I don't see anything happening. Somebody is going to put the table. Yes, the table is, is coming behind you. Stephen, I have one question for you. I have actually a million questions, but one. Um, you, you say that uh, during the history of, of science, we used to see the world as a kind of, the universe of the space, space, as kind of receptacle, a box, right? For many times. Well, general relativity would not exactly think the same thing, but it's okay. However, you think that <coughs> space in, is made of points, infinitely small points. Well, there used to be something called ether before Einstein, and Einstein disposed and dispatched the whole notion of ether. So, Mr. Wolfram, are you actually rediscovering ether? That's the question for you. And you have exactly two minutes, 30 seconds to answer. Okay. <laughs> you know, the ether has been back for a long time. In quantum field theory, there's an ether. The cosmic microwave background is like an ether. But the, the idea that space is made of something, that there is a, uh, yes, it's, it's uh, as a matter of fact, there was a theory in the late 1800s that atoms were like vortices in the ether. This theory, I don't think is, it's not in detail correct, 
But this theory, we're back with a similar kind of thing. We're, we're, we're dealing with topological obstructions in a hypergraph, but it's the same kind of idea. So, so in a sense, the, the notion, the, the sort of pure mathematical notion, we just write down a formula and that describes how the world works, and there's nothing, there's nothing there, so to speak. This is not what I'm saying. There is, there is something there, and the thing that's there is, is, is something very abstract. I mean, this is not a, you know, when you say, uh, uh, you know, for example, these points, they don't have a position. They define position, so to speak. All that, all that one says about these points is how they are related to each other. So everything else must emerge from those, those relations. So yes, it's a, it, is a, it is a nice and charming thing that the, I mean, you know, it, it should be emphasized. You know, one of the things people say about relativity is, oh, that means that there is no absolute reference frame in the universe. Well, actually, for the last, I don't know, 30, 40 years now, it's been known that the Earth is moving at 1,000th of the speed of light relative to the center of mass of the universe. There is a preferred reference frame. It's the preferred reference frame of the cosmic microwave background. So it's, you know, these, these things which are kind of quick summaries of what these theories say don't always capture what, what's going on. I think the, um, uh, the I was, was actually, I happened to just be studying the history of thermodynamics. It's a fascinating history. It's a, it's, which I think I finally unraveled. And I, I'm like, why has nobody unraveled this before? The main reason is because people haven't known why the second law of thermodynamics is actually true. And so you can't, you can't go back and see. But, but, but that's, uh, anyway, you said a few seconds, and I took more than a few seconds. It's, um, um, but uh, yes, it's a, it's a good and interesting question. It's a, it's a charming, it's the question of why people believed that space is not made of anything it will be seen one day as one of those little glitches in the history of science. People were really close. I mean, Einstein, for example, in 1916, he wrote to somebody, said, in the end, we'll discover that space is discrete, just like matter, just like electromagnetic radiation. But he said, we do not yet have the mathematical tools necessary to see how this will work. A hundred years later, we do. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. You deserve a round of applause. Okay, now uh, I would like to, to call uh, uh, Professor Luis Fresco um, uh, and uh, uh, Hisham Rapti, the president of the university, for the formal ceremony of uh, launching the Luis Fresco Fund for Academic Mobility in Africa. Um, yeah. You know, the, the, I think the, the, the history of the Luis Fresco Fund has been... Uh, uh, yes, you can, can sit down there. <laughs> oui, vous pouvez passer par là ou par là. C'est assez complexe comme situation. Tu peux passer par là. <laughs> tu peux passer par en haut aussi. <laughs> oui, uh, Luis va, va, va dire deux ou trois choses. Je vais juste présenter le, le fond en, en quelques mots. Euh, voilà, c'est une histoire, je trouve que c'est une très belle histoire. Il y a quelques mois, euh, j'étais à Amsterdam et Louise m'a dit, on va prendre un café ensemble dans notre café préféré, qui est le café de Jaren, Doolenstraat, à Amsterdam. Et Louise m'a dit, écoute, il m'est arrivé quelque chose d'assez sympa. On m'a remis un prix, le prix Justus von Liebig. Euh, Louise est grand scientifique, bien sûr, elle m'a dit, bon, il y a une médaille, il y a un diplôme, il y a tout ce que tu veux, mais il y a aussi une partie monétaire de ce prix, 25 000 euros, et Louise m'a dit, tu sais quoi, j'ai envie d'en de, faire plutôt un fonds pour euh, la mobilité entre, en Afrique, c'est-à-dire que des Sud-Africains viennent au Maroc, des Kenyans vont au Sénégal, des choses comme ça, euh, pour que vous soyez, bon, je crois que Louise va en parler beaucoup mieux que moi, et euh, alors elle a dit, très bien, je vais vous donner en fait cette partie monétaire. Alors ce geste extrêmement généreux euh, m'a beaucoup ému. J'ai appelé euh, dans la foulée le même jour euh, Monsieur Mustafa Tarab euh, pour lui dire cela et Monsieur Rapti. Et Monsieur Mustafa Tarab m'a dit, bah, très bien, on va matcher euh, ce fonds. Matcher en métier en par 10 parce que c'est la façon de Monsieur Tarab de matcher les choses. <rire> Et euh, les Sud-Africains vont aussi matcher. Et donc ce fonds va exister dans cinq minutes 
après un petit speech de Louise et quand le président de l'UM6P et Louise auront signé le document juridique qui crée le fonds. Et ce fonds va être logé, c'est une très belle coïncidence, à quelque chose que nous venons de créer ici qui s'appelle « Institute ». For Advanced Studies, ou Institute of Advanced Studies, que nous voulons de créer. Et c'est à l'intérieur de cet institut que ce fonds va être administré. Et donc, toutes les universités d'excellence en Afrique ont vocation pour rejoindre ce fonds. Et on va donc créer une espèce de, de, de mouvement, dessin entre les scientifiques africains qui viennent chez les autres africains, euh, etc. On n'aura plus besoin de passer par Paris, Londres ou euh, d'autres capitales. On pourra faire du travail ensemble, entre Africains, en Afrique, grâce à Louise Fresco, à qui je donne la parole maintenant. Assalamu alaikum. Bonjour tout le monde. Good morning, everybody. Merci Fouad. Je vais faire mon intervention en anglais, puisque je vais promis de parler l'anglais. Um, it's a great honor for me to stand here uh, because this is really a dream coming through. I was a very young undergraduate student when I first went to Africa. I first went to Zambia, later on also worked for a long time in the Congo. I think I visited for work all, nearly all African countries, maybe two exceptions. And I've always felt that Africa for me is the continent of promise. At the end of this century, there will be four billion Africans. But it's the only continent where we have space, water, and a lot of potential in terms of a young population to really make a difference to the world as a whole. What always struck me working and being bilingual myself, working in French speaking and English speaking Africa, is that there was relatively little contact. It's improving and I think young students now speak more English. But when I received the prize, um, this was the Eustace von Liebig Lifetime Award for food security, I felt I wanted to do something with it, not keep it for anything in Europe, to really give it back to the continent where I've learned so much. And I really am very, very pleased to dedicate this fund with the two leading universities here in Bengaria and in Pretoria to start a network of young students, young staff, scientists to work on the broader issues of development. And for Africa, as anywhere else in the world, that has to be agriculture, it has to be environment, it has to be the whole use of resources from the inputs all the way to those who need to eat. And I'm emphasizing this, the importance of agriculture and food production, because in the world of today, there is still no more important subject. There is no country in the world that has developed itself by neglecting its agriculture. And in the future, when I think of the next couple of decades, we will need agriculture not just as a producer of food, but also as a producer of raw materials and useful molecules for the future, because we will have to replace all the molecules from the petrochemicals. And we also need an agriculture and a food production system that is really resource use efficient, so that we can free the land that is necessary for ecosystems and concentrate agriculture there where there is water, where there is the, the possibility to really improve agriculture. And I'm very firmly of the opinion that for me, Africa is the continent of hope, where there is so much potential, where there are many, many resources. And it is a matter of creating, in my view, a new elite of young people who really want to bring this forward. Again, as I said, there is no solution to the climate issue, for example, if we don't look also at the ways in which agriculture, highly intensive, high-tech agriculture, is helping to, for example, capture carbon in the soil. So there is this potential, but the potential always comes from people. The people who are directed by a strong scientific base, who want to be experimental, who want to really test their hypotheses, and want to provide politicians with science-based options for the future. And I would really love to see this fund contributing to a group of people, a class of mobile young Africans that exchange ideas, that come together in some of the really beautiful universities we have. And I, I say we because I feel a little bit part 
of the African University system myself. I think we can do that. I would really like to invite you. It's not going to be my fund. Let's be very clear about it. It was the choice here to give it my name. I, I'm proud but also embarrassed in a way, but it's not the fund that I'm going to manage and take decisions about. It's going to be the Fund for Africa hosted here together with Pretoria to build a really strong class of African leaders for the future. Thank you very much for giving me this chance. UNP6 at Pretoria. Okay, so uh, now is the sermon of uh, signing the thing. I'm not familiar with this kind of ceremonies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Louise. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, so now we are more or less uh, finished uh, the first half day of UM6P uh, Science Week. Um, just one word. The departments of the university have taken Science Week this year very seriously. So. Every department of the university has a stand somewhere there, and we are going to inaugurate them. Uh, they are supposed to show, show off if you want, to show us what they have done this year. So I will uh, ask uh, Mr. Mustafa Tarab, Luis Fresco, Mr. Governor of the province, and Mr. President of the university, to uh, and all the distinguished guests to formally inaugurate uh, the stands. So, if you want to follow me, I see this is beautiful. Uh, what is this? Somebody has uh, <laughs> made pictures of. Uh, I, I'm not sure Mr. President will be happy with the, the caricature that's been made of him here in the corner, right there. He looks like a Mexican bandit. Anyway, let's uh, go and inaugurate the stand. Thank you. 